Will President Trump get his border wall? Was he unwittingly working for the Russians? And is Gillette right to attack toxic masculinity? And find out what the media missed in our most underreported stories of the week. I'm Adam Bearn, and this is The Square Circle. Hello and welcome to The Square Circle. I'm your host, Adam Bearn. Joining us today are Zed Jelani of The Intercept, Michael Schindler of Young Voices, and Kelly Vlahos of The American Conservative. Welcome, everyone. The government shutdown is now in its fourth week with no end in sight. Negotiations between President Trump and Democratic leaders are at a standstill as Trump insists on funding for a border wall, which House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has called immoral. So, Michael Schindler... How much longer is this going to last? It's going to um, uh, keep on going until we reconcile ourselves to what um, a wall possibly means. Uh, the wall has taken on an extremely symbolic um, role in this discussion. It's no longer a mere potential bulwark against legal immigration. It's, um, it's just something about our, what our country is. Uh, early on in our history, we were a nation defined by our, front, by our open frontiers. Now we're a nation defined um, by our limits. Early on in our country's history, uh, we had much to develop. And now that we've developed much, um, for example, our liberties, our, our freedoms, in fact, our very way of life, uh, we've realized that those things deserve protection. That's what the wall represents. Um, so if the Democrats reconcile themselves to that fact, what the wall represents, then I think that they'll give in to the relatively, like, minor sum that uh, Trump's asking for. Well, the Democrats are not going to agree to build a wall from coast to coast, are they? I mean... Well, we're not asking for a wall from uh, coast to coast. Um, what, uh, what Trump is asking for is um, just some cash to build, I think, about... Um, like a wall that would um, uh, be slightly larger than the wall c um, currently present and would not include that is that the Democrats just have to agree what the wall stands for and therefore they should just give in and just give the money to President Trump. Do you agree? Well, I see where Michael's coming from in terms of the symbolic nature of the debate, but I feel like this might not be the, the debate or the fight that even Republicans wanted to have, because I know there are certain things that they really wanted to be on the table, like E-Verify or um, changing the way that we bring people in, um, ending the, the family lottery uh, process. Um, these are actual tangible policies that they have tried to push each time immigration reform gets to the table. That's not no longer uh, at, at the front and center. What is at the front and center is this symbolic wall. So I feel like at some point, and it, it, it is a game of chicken, you know, either the Republicans are going to start urging uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell to start playing ball, and, um, or they'll, they'll, they'll dig in for the hard fight because core base leaders like Ann Coulter are saying we want the wall or nothing. So I do think it is sort of a game of chicken both on the Republican side and then between each faction. But one thing that I have to say is I think um, you're going to start seeing the American people start losing patience with this. I mean, you're talking about 450,000 people who are now working without pay. So it's not people who are even at home uh, looking for, uh, you know, to, you know, for work elsewhere in the gig economy or just waiting for this to pass. People are actually being called back to work now. And I think most Americans are looking at that saying that's very unfair to have people working for no pay for an indefinite amount of time. And it's not just the you know, the swamp in Washington it is, has a ripple effect for all the federal workers throughout the country in their communities, and they're going to start seeing the impact. So I think the loss of patience might be coming, too. Okay. <clears throat> and if we're going to stretch Kelly's metaphor of it being a game of chicken, who's going to cross the road first? Uh, my sense is that what's going to happen is President Trump has at certain times kind of compromised on what he means uh, as a wall. He may end up 
uh, coughing, they may end up coughing some amount of security funding. He'll say, okay, that's going to go towards a wall. It may end up going towards a fence or existing infrastructure. Uh, and he'll probably declare a win, and the Democrats will probably declare a win because there isn't going to be a literal wall on the, on the border. So I, I imagine that's what's going to happen. Unfortunately, for those out of work, it seems like they're just dragging the process along until that, that point comes where they both kind of have to bite the bullet. Yeah, well, I mean, Kelly pointed out Ann Coulter and, uh, and elements of the Republican base who demand a wall, and that President Trump is essentially beholden to this mission of building a wall. So... Surely there has to be a wall or the shutdown will continue. Well, honestly, I think that he likes the sound of saying he's going to build a wall. I think that's part of the reason he's, he's kept this going since the campaign. It was an applause line. Uh, but I think at certain points he has kind of conceded that a physical wall in every part of the board does not make sense. Uh, that some parts there's already a steel fence. or Ultimately, the solution here is a more comprehensive E-Verify program, which is something his advisors surely know. So I think if there's something that he can declare a wall, even if it's not literally a wall, I mean, he gets away kind of stretching the truth all the time. So I think that's probably how this is going to end at some point. They'll give him some funding for some existing infrastructure, and he'll, he'll say it's a win. Okay. And Michael, you talked about it being a relatively small sum. I'm not sure $5 billion is a small sum of money. I'll take it if anyone wants to give it to me. But um, isn't it true that when it comes to immigration, most of the illegal immigration that comes through the country is actually from people overstaying their visas. And mm -hmm. indeed, this year it was, again, may, way more people overstayed visas than crossed the border illegally. Mm -hmm. So we don't really need the wall. That's not going to solve illegal immigration, is to, it? To push back on that, I think that the current numbers are that it's, um, depending on the year, around half. So around uh, half will come in, uh, overstay their visas, around half will come over like, illegally. Um, now. That's still a very, very big number. Like a lot of folks just start overstaying their visas, and that's a large part of the, of the legal immigration problem. Um, but like one shouldn't discount that uh, the fact that like nearly half, or even like smaller estimates are one third, like of folks come over across the border physically, like walking here. A lot of them, as President Trump pointed out in his recent address, dying on the way. Um, uh, it's a problem for a lot of reasons that needs to be addressed. Like it isn't something that's only a small part of the larger mosaic of legal immigration. It's about half the issue. And Kelly Vlahos, the, the president, you know, he talks about the wall and, and that being necessary. Where do you see it fitting into immigration more widely? Well, right now, nowhere. Like I said before, the real tangible policy changes that could be made to uh, fix the broken system, because I think both sides recognize that the system is broken. Um, that's not, those things aren't being debated right now. What's being debated is wall or no wall. And I feel like it's become so politicized. It's, it's all about politics. I mean, I, I don't know which senator said it, but somebody had, had brought it up. I don't know if it was Lindsey Graham saying this is a metaphor. The wall is a metaphor. Well, now that you have 450,000 people working without pay, you have people that are having to go to the soup kitchen in, in D.C., you have actual tangible results of a shutdown in this city and beyond. People are saying, I, I, I didn't vote. I didn't vote for Donald Trump. I didn't vote uh, for Nancy Pelosi so we can debate about metaphors when real life issues are happening. So my, my instinct on this is that the, the, there will be a saturation point for the patience level of the American people. It's, it's whoever feels that they're being hurt politically the most. Will it be the Democrats? Will it be Donald Trump? I think once Donald Trump senses that he's losing, his base is shrinking, then he might, like Zed said, might, you know, sort of, you know, start, start those compromise talks. Okay, absolutely. We'll see where it goes with that. But uh, right now, I'd like to remind our viewers that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, or via Facebook or Twitter, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air towards the end of the show. Also this week, the New York Times and Washington Post revealed new information on President Trump's relationship with Russia. Here's the story from NBC News. The Times reports that in 2017, the FBI investigated the president directly, suspicious that he might be aiding Russia. And the Post wrote that former officials described the president as curiously secretive about his conversations with Vladimir Putin, even keeping interpreters' notes from senior advisors. So is it possible that President Trump could be a Russian agent, said Jelani? Well, you know, I think uh, Trump was probably dodging that question, partly because it was, it was a kind of a silly question. 
Uh, it's kind of like asking, uh, do you beat your wife, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I think he was kind of trolling the media a little bit for a couple of days. But I do think that the Mueller investigation, you know, I don't think it's a witch hunt. I, I think when President Trump calls it that, he's, he's trying to deflect away from something. And it may not necessarily be that he has some uh, nefarious uh, collusion with Russians. It may just be that he has some sort of personal affinity for Vladimir Putin. And it may also just be that he has business dealings all over the world, and Mueller is looking at all of them. You know, he's investigated ties between the UAE and the Trump campaign, between Israel and Kushner. So I think that, you know, Trump is very, very touchy for this reason, and that often puts off uh, the impression that maybe he was doing something with Russia, although we don't really have that particular information yet. But I don't think he does himself a lot of favors with his general defensiveness and attack in the investigation. Sure, and that special counsel, Robert Mueller, you're referring to there. Uh, Michael, why do you think the president, uh, the FBI decided to look into the president of the United States as a counterintelligence operation? I think that it's because there are a lot of voices in government um, that want to use the... Like, uh, the idea of collusion to pursue the president um, uh, politically because there are a variety of ways that you can um, uh, I can attack somebody, you can attack somebody in, uh, in terms of their policy ideas, their legislation, and then you can impugn their character. Um, Is that what the FBI was doing here, do you think? I think that it's one of the functions of um, calling for such an investigation. Um, but this I, wasn't anyone calling for an investigation. Well, this was the FBI opening a counterintelligence investigation. Well, like when the FBI opens up a counterintelligence investigation, it's because somebody else like, called for it. Um, well, the re press report suggests that it was because when the president fired then FBI director James Comey, mm -hmm. that people within the FBI were concerned that he might have been doing this off the back of his mm -hmm. links to Russia. So I don't think that that's like a very valid concern. Like to suppose that like the president is actually like a Russian agent. Um, but like assuming that like that was a valid concern, then one of the functions of such a, like of such an of such an investigation is political, and the other functions are obviously um, uh, like exactly what they say they are, which is to investigate the president. But I think that there is a political component to it. So, Kelly, do you agree? Was it purely political, or did the FBI I, really have something to be worried yeah, about? Yeah, I'd like to push back a little. I feel like the president is defensive because he has been investigated since the Mueller investigation began, which was in May 19 or 2017. So we're nearing the two-year mark, mm -hmm. and so far you've had. Uh, some 33 people have been indicted by Mueller. None of them have been uh, indicted for collusion in terms of Trump's campaign, Trump himself colluding with the Russians to win the 2016 election. So you have a lot of people who have been arrested for uh, meddling and, you know, using Twitter and other social media means. You have Michael Cohen, you have uh, Paul Manafort, um, all n not so uh, not, n not so nice figures, but yet that, that smoking gun has yet to be delivered to the American people. So for almost two years now, the media has been driving this narrative that President Trump is a agent of the Russians, he was colluding, um, we would not have him in the White House now if it wasn't for his help by the Russians, and so far we have no evidence to bolster those claims. But yet the media will stir up these tempests in a teapot, like the uh, this counterintelligence story. Well, when he had bragged that he, or not bragged, but when he said he fired Comey and he suggested it was because of, of this Russia investigation, the FBI opened up this side investigation. But from what I understand from some law experts, it was all part of the Mueller, their, the Mueller collusion overall investigation they're working on anyway, and they no, thought, was, well, maybe one well, had to do with the other. The FBI investigation was opened before the Mueller right. investigation. And so this, the, when he had said, that he, when he himself had suggested, I'm not saying that Trump doesn't st stick his foot in it all the time, but when he himself had suggested that his firing of Comey might have been, had something to do with the Russia investigation, that's when they launched their, this side investigation that could be uh, a criminal, a, a, uh, um, obstruction as part of a general, the collusion investigation. I mean, I'm almost tripping over my tongue trying to talk about this, but we all know these investigations were going on. Like you pointed out, it was going on before he was president. So I feel like the media finds that they have to keep this in the news cycle. They have to generate this, this excitement that, oh my goodness, this smoking gun is going to come at any moment. But I think um, there are a lot of people out there who are a little tired of it because so far the big reveal has yet to come. And I think all of us at this table 
could sit here last year and put on MSNBC and, and some of these um, talk radio and, and hear like this, this excitement, like it's coming, he's gone, he's finished, and it never happened. Okay, and we're still to see Robert Mueller's full report. But, said Jelani, shouldn't there be a concern here that the FBI, supposedly an independent body, is opening an investigation into the president? I mean, the FBI have previous in this kind of thing, way back to J. Edgar Hoover, in influencing politics, meddling in politics with these kinds of investigations. Well, to know whether or not it's appropriate, we probably have to know more information. Uh, as Kelly had mentioned, throughout the entire the Mueller investigation, uh, we've had lots of people go down for various minor petty things, you know, campaign finance violations, things like that. Um, and it kind of does raise the question of, is the FBI and the Mueller just kind of fishing to try to get people on something to justify their own kind of investigation? On the other hand, um, normally nobody in a presidential campaign goes down for a campaign vi finance violation, and the FBI very rarely uh, looks into high senior officials in the government. So there is a case to be made that there should be kind of an ongoing permanent in uh, investigative role for people like Bob Mueller, uh, for the FBI, throughout the entire government. But if they're just kind of chasing the Russia tail over and over and not really getting the goods, uh, then it could there, the opposite case could be made that uh, this is kind of them trying to justify the, continuing the investigation when they're not necessarily getting what they're looking for. Sure, and I think important to remember that a lot of these convictions have been, as you say, for minor things, but because they've been plea agreements where we don't know the full story, what right. the full charges right. might have been, um, I'm just worried. Do you worry about this role of the FBI in this in this sense? Um, I think that, I mean, the role of the FBI. It's one of the many many checks um, uh, um, that the government has on like its different um, limbs. So, while I don't think it's particularly fruitful, I think that even like even though this instance is, isn't that fruitful, that overall like this sort of like action in government is probably a good thing. Okay, and Kelly, when it comes to you're saying there's no evidence of collusion there, but you can't deny, surely, that some of the president's positions towards Russia and that area have been pro-Russian. Well, Pulling out Syria, you know, uh, and things like that, that, that perhaps, you know, the, the Russians would like. But if, if you take the, the, the sum total of his record on Russia since he was uh, inaugurated, he's actually been tougher on, on Russia than even his predecessor. Uh, Barack Obama has been. He actually, I mean, one of the biggest things that he's done in the last year has agreed, he's agreed to arm the Ukrainians against the Russians in, in, in their ongoing conflict. Uh, even Barack Obama refused to do that. And at the anger of, risking the anger of, of Senator, the now late Senator McCain, who could not believe that we weren't arming them up. I mean, he was really hawkish on this. And, and Trump is doing exactly what McCain had wanted. But I feel because there's such a, uh, a desire to have this narrative that he is in the in the tank for Russia, that you know the the Democratic pundits just kind of glossed right over that. But let's okay. look at his record. Okay, thanks. Well, we'll have to move on now. But uh, our final topic tonight is on Gillette, who are out with a new commercial on toxic masculinity, and it's garnered plenty of criticism. Here again is NBC News. A men's razor commercial without a single shot of razors. Is this the best a man can get? Instead, scene after scene questioning masculinity in the age of Me Too. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. After 30 years, the company Gillette giving a modern twist to the best a man can get, showing viral moments of men confronting bullies. That's not how we treat each other, okay? But now the commercial itself is going viral. Finding support on Twitter, but also criticism, some calling it condescending, patronizing, and utterly tone deaf. So, Kelly Vallejos, Gillette, are they promoting a positive message or are they overstepping the mark here? Well, you know, I, I, I watched this video with everybody else that was a, the, the other morning, and within five seconds, I, it was screaming in my head, corporate pandering. I couldn't get past the, the next five, ten seconds of it because I felt so insulted, you know, that this company that should be telling me why their product's the best to shave my legs is telling me how to raise my son. And I found that deeply offensive. I find it deeply offensive whenever a corporation tries to teach me morality or teach me moderation or teach my son or my husband how to behave towards women. So right off the bat, I think that the, the tone deafness, um, the obvious pandering um, in the age of Me Too was a big turnoff for a lot of people. As far as the, the content of, of the advertisement, I felt that Gillette 
which has been responsible, just like the rest of the advertising industry, of promoting um, sexed up products and gender stereotypes for decades, is now turning around and trying to act as though they're on the spear point of this uh, social change is insulting. And what they're doing is suggesting that all of these bad actors that you see in in the advertisement, whether they're you know uh, guys ogling women or the boys that are bullying, you know, are the norm and not the exception. And I feel that it's it's broadly insulting to to every man and every every generation that they depicted, because it wasn't just young boys, it wasn't just millennials, it was older gentlemen, and there was no representation of real strong male role models other than these guys who post Weinstein figured out that it was not cool to ogle women and uh, their boys to fight in front of them at the cookout. So I felt that um, they were insulting on that level and I feel like this is all part of something we've been seeing in this Me Too. It's just like let's, let's brandish all men as bad and wrong and needed to be fixed. And I, and I think that that's going to be so counterproductive as we're moving forward. Zed Jelani, how did you see it? Are they trying to fix masculine culture or is this a positive message? I mean, I think there's a trend now of uh, U.S. corporations kind of jumping into social issues, thinking that they can activate a type of consumer that thinks they're accomplishing something by buying their product, right? Like if you buy Gillette shavers, you're not like, you know, helping stop abuse towards women. You know, you, you might feel good about yourself, but as far as I know, Gillette still charges more for shaving products for, for women in their, in their women-owned uh, line than they do for men. You know, maybe that's something they could change if they want to help women. Uh, and something these firms never do is they never brag about how well they pay their uh, workforce, the benefits they give, the affordability of their products, you know, the actual thing they run on, which is like capital and money, right? They're always trying to dive into some kind of culture war thing and activate a group of people who are trying to buy their products to feel good about themselves. Now, is, is there a debate about masculinity? I think there probably should be. Uh, the, the conception of masculinity has changed over the years, but it's probably not going to be led by a shaving company that's trying to basically generate a bunch of uh, just press coverage just to, to, set, to sell products at this point. And as Kelly pointed out, you know, Gillette has often been the company that's telling you that you have to you know, shave your legs in order to look good for somebody else, that you have to do X, Y, and Z. And you know that's just that's not really the way to, to have a conversation about this. You know, this is this is to segment people and to generate like a hyped up customer base. You know, that that can try to justify uh, buying products when really, if you want to help women, you should be donating to your women's shelter. You know, you should be uh, helping uh, t raise your, your your sons and daughters. Right? You should, there's plenty of things that you can be doing, but bu buying a particular shaver is it's not not really high on the list. Okay, and not much defense of Gillette so far, Michael Schindler. How do you see it? I think it's actually quite interesting that we like live in an age where large razor companies can put, can pontificate at us about sexual ethics and like what it means to be a proper man. I think it means that um, like capital really is at the center of um, uh, what makes our society run. It's our focal point. It's the thing which orders our lives. It occupies the position that say um, uh, the church once held, and if it does occupy that position that the church once held, then it's no surprise that it's the ones delivering like sermons, um, like. It's its function. Um, it's the actual message of the commercial. Um, you know, be nice to women and um, don't let people bully other people. That, that seems relatively unobjectionable. Um, it's just a bit disconcerting. It's coming from a razor company of, um, uh, like of all places. Well, who should it come from then? Oh, it should come, uh, well, either from public intellectuals or the church, um, like one of the two. Like people who are making um, uh, like the case for morality in public life. Okay. All right, thank you very much. And uh, now it's time to take some questions from our viewers. And we'll start with one. And given that we're just talking about Gillette, we'll go with one from John Wilson, who asks, was Gillette's ad more about creating controversy for publicity purposes than sending a positive message? No, I don't think so. I think this was, they, they just, they, I mean, they, this was egg on their face as far as I'm concerned. And I don't think it was planned that way. I don't think they planned to get the backlash they did. I think, I, I, I think, you know, this idea that these, these corporations see profit um, in jumping into social change and social movements, the, the, the social uh, justice warrior milieu um, is a very real thing. And I think we should take a look, you know, at a couple weeks or whenever the Super Bowl is, when we see all the advertisers for the Super Bowl and how many are reflecting, you know, this new ethos 
of trying to pander uh, to the women's movement and Me Too and whatever the you know the the zeitgeist is right now. And it, that'll be interesting because this is a predominantly male sport with a predominantly male audience, and I don't know how men are going to uh, really react to being lectured while they're drinking their beer and watching. Uh, and giving all their money over to the NFL and, and, and all the advertising and, and, and everything that goes with it. Okay, and Zed, I'm wondering if you might agree with John Wilson here. You seem to suggest that maybe this was about stirring up some publicity. Yeah, I mean, actually, corporations are legally bound. Like publicly traded companies can't do anything that's against their bottom line, right? And these these campaigns, you know, going back the past decade especially, have always been about generating publicity, uh, targeting some subsegment of consumers. I mean, Chick Fil A does it from the right. You know, at the same time, uh, Chick Fil A understands that its consumer base is in the South, so they they don't really get any hit from donating to Focus on the Family or donating to right wing groups because that's their customer base. Gillette probably ran some polling of uh, you know cities in New England, uh, younger folks, and decided to go for this. Just like Nike decided to endorse uh, Con Kaepernick, uh, despite the fact that. You know, so many kids die every year in urban centers, minority kids fighting over Nike because they're so overpriced and they sell it as a matter of privilege and prestige when it's stupid because it's a shoe. So, you okay. know, unfortunately, these companies are taking the role that I believe my colleague just said, you know, public intellectuals and society and our, our faith leaders and our NGOs should be doing. Okay. And we'll take our second question, which comes from Amy Walden, who asks, if President Trump has nothing to hide when it comes to Russia, why did he take his interpreter's notes from his meeting with Vladimir Putin? Um, I can get that one if you want. Um, so, one of the prerogatives of the president is foreign policy. Um, uh, the Constitution gives him uh, that unique, expansive uh, amount of uh, powers with regard to that domain. Um, now, when you're talking with other heads of state on sensitive matters, like for example, you're trying to strike a deal. Um, deals require concessions. However, like. If it gets out, for example, that you might be offering a concession, then any evidence of that could be interpreted as like high treason, say, by internal parties. Like in this case, the Democrats, and likely discussion might have had something to do with um, uh, the sanctions discussion currently. It's ongoing. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to not let anyone else a chance to jump in, but we want to give you a chance to give us your most underreported story of this week. So who would like to start there? Zed, go on, get us, kick us yeah. off. So here, here in D.C., uh, the city council is kind of trying, wants to do an experiment where basically they're going to decriminalize fare evasion in the, the metro system. Uh, the mayor just vetoed it, and it's very, very controversial. You know, both sides kind of have kind of compelling arguments, but from what I understand, most cities have done nothing like this. It's very regular to see, especially kids arrested uh, when they jump a stall or something. So it'll be really interesting to see how the politics of this plays out in kind of a, a liberalish city like Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you. And did I just step on one of you who were about to jump in? No, oh, no, no it's uh, fine. I'll go next. Um, so earlier today in an underground auditorium at the Pentagon, President Trump delivered a speech um, on the Space Force and what he was planning to do. Um, now, one of the things that we knew that he was going to do was um, uh, further develop our space-based missile interceptor layer. One of the things that we didn't know but uh, had perhaps thought of was that... Um, he's going to look into putting actual um, uh, like missile defensive capabilities in space. So not shooting like, like missiles from ships or from land, but literally shooting missiles from space at other missiles, um, possibly fulfilling like Reagan's vision of the Star Wars program. Yeah, it sounds so, like Star Wars cool. to me. And Kelly, we're running out of yeah, time. Sure. but well, um, give us your this is a developing story. story. A uh, Iranian uh, American reporter uh, from uh, Press TV was reportedly detained at an airport in St. Louis and is currently reportedly being de detained right here in Washington. We have no verification. The FBI says they're not commenting. Um, is this retaliation for reporters and others who have been detained in Iran? We don't know. So I, 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 I just, I, I feel that we should be keeping our eye out whether our government is detaining people with Americans without charge um, or talking to the media about it. We'll see what happens. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. And that is all we have time for this week. My name's Adam Bierne. Thank you for watching The Square Circle. We'll see you next week.